theater shooting. As many of you know, yesterday was the one-year anniversary of this horrific event that plagued our city. And I was just reminded as I was reflecting upon that yesterday about how many people today are still struggling uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually. How many family members are still struggling as a result of these events that happened uh, last year. And so let's just bow together for a word of prayer and uh, let's pray for God's richest blessings on uh, those that are hurting today. Lord, we come before you today in the wonderful name of Jesus. We're reminded of the uh, events of last year and how our city has struggled and, and how so many people have been hurting. Uh, we pray for your richest blessings and your healing touch to, to uh, fill the void and the, the pain of all of those that are, that are struggling today. Lord, I know many are having physical problems as a result of uh, gunshot wounds or, or other things and obviously emotional trauma that's taken, taken on uh, much pain as well. Lord, there's family members, husbands, wives, children, parents, um, all kinds of different, different emotions and struggles today. And we pray for your, your healing touch and for your blessings upon those that are hurting today. Use our church to continue to make a difference in this community as we have been given a, such a great platform to do so uh, in uh, the days behind us, Lord, and we believe even greater opportunity in the days ahead. We look forward, God, to being a light in the darkness in this city and use us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And many of you know last year God was able to use our church in a, in a powerful way during the Aurora Theater shooting. We, we, uh, God, God was able to, to really open some fantastic doors uh, for us to help a lot of people. We were able to help some of the victims financially. We were able to be a part of the uh, a prayer rally um, and uh, just to do so many other things to really reach out and to help those that were hurting. Uh, we had over 700 people at our church the Sunday after the shooting, and, and many of those people committed their lives to the Lord. And some of you came for your very first time on that Sunday last year. This is kind of like your one-year anniversary to the church. So uh, we are giving God praise for the healing and for the, for the salvation and for the life change that's gone on as a result. At the same time, we're still very sensitive to those that are hurting and continue to pray for God's richest blessings and his very best and all those that are still struggling and working through the issues related to this tragedy. I want you to open your Bibles today to the 13th chapter of John. Jesus is gathered in the upper room. It's the Last Supper. It's his final meeting. It's his final meal with the disciples. The 12 are gathered with Jesus. And of course, the 12 are Jesus' cl most close closely associated friends. They're the ones that he poured his life into for a period of three years. And, and, and the disciples are unaware of this, but Jesus is just about to be arrested and crucified in the hours ahead. Jesus is saying some of his final things. He's, he's giving some of his final instruction to the 12 in the upper room. They're eating a meal together. They're celebrating the Passover meal. And the Jewish people have been celebrating the Passover for thousands of years. It was reflective of the deliverance of the Egyptian captivity. Uh, as, as you may know, in the book of Exodus, the Israelites were slaves there in the country of Egypt for several hundred years before Moses came on the scene and delivered the people. And so the Passover meal is, is a time to celebrate the faithfulness of God to the Jewish people for delivering them for the Egyptian captivity. And so Jesus and the disciples are celebrating this. They're observing this. They are eating the Passover meal. And Jesus begins to do some teaching and instruction. But you know what? This is no normal meeting. The air is filled with tenseness. There's an awkwardness in the meeting. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting before and it seemed like everything was going great. And then all of a sudden it got really weird. That was what was going on here in the upper room. Think about this. Judas Iscariot is just about to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus calls him out. Peter is about to deny the Lord three times in the coming hours. And all of the disciples, Luke chapter 22 tells us, are fighting about who is the greatest in the kingdom. You know, one disciple's like, man, I got bigger biceps than you. You know, and another disciple's like, man, I'm a better preacher. And another disciple's like, man, I know how to pray better than you. There's this competition. They're jockeying for a position, and, 
And it was with all that in mind that Jesus does something that was so profound and extraordinary. He got up from the table. He gathered a pitcher of water and a basin and a towel, took off his outer garment, and began to wash the feet of the disciples. You see, rabbis would often teach in the context of a meal, but but Jesus was not just merely delivering a lecture. Jesus was preaching a sermon with his actions. And his washing of the feet was a beautiful metaphor of what it means to be a servant. And here's, here's my prayer for the Edge Church. As our church continues to expand and to grow and to do great things for God in this community, I, I'm praying that our church would be an army of servants to this community. That everywhere that we turn, that, that we would see opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to serve people and to serve the Lord. And this is so much in line with the heart of Jesus Christ. It really is. Now Jesus is washing the disciples' feet and this is kind of awkward. I mean, Jesus obviously is the son of God. I mean, he's like the most esteemed. He's the leader and now he's doing the role of a servant. In the ancient world, those that washed feet were the slaves. And now Jesus is... is is, is washing the feet of the disciples, but he's the leader. And so this was so life-altering and so confusing, the disciples even resisted it. You know, they didn't know what to think about it, you know, because they esteemed Jesus, and rightly so. But, but now Jesus is washing our feet. You know, feet washing is a nasty thing. I, I remember as a college student, I was kind of idealistic, you know, and... And if, if some of you are in college today, you might know what I'm talking about. If you were in college and you were idealistic, you might understand where I was. But I read this passage, John chapter 13, and I thought, we're going to have a foot washing for our college campus Bible study. And so we got a bunch of water and a bunch of bowls, you know, and I shared this story. And as a leader of our Bible study, you know, I was washing some feet. Some other leaders were washing feet. And I want to tell you, I was expecting a moment from God. I was expecting some angels to show up, you know, kind of some hallelujah chorus in the background. But I got to tell you, it was the nastiest thing I had ever done before. <laughs> I mean, it was not good. I mean, feet, first of all, are just filthy nasty anyway, aren't they? I mean, is there anything grosser than, than somebody else's feet, you know? I don't mind my own feet, but I don't want to see... Feet smell bad, and they didn't have tough acting to actin back in the ancient world, okay? <laughs> Funky things. on. Some people have hobbit feet, you know, hairy type feet, nasty feet. And I was washing some feet, you know, and I, about the third person, I was like, man, you guys can wash your own darn feet, you know? I mean, <laughs> forget this, man. This is disgusting. The water turned brown, you know? And Anyway, you get the idea. It was gross. I'm so glad today I don't live in the first century world, you know, because in the first century world, washing feet was even more disgusting than it is today because, because people didn't have like normal shoes, they wore sandals, so if it was wet outside, their feet were muddy, and if it was dry outside, their feet were dusty, but either way, people's feet were a lot grosser, right? People still had second toes bigger than the first toes, and people still had hairy toes and all that stuff, but... It was just downright nasty. It, it, it was something that was, that was gross in the ancient world. It's something that's gross today. Jesus didn't have any latex gloves. And so he's just washing the disciples' feet, man. Showing that, that heart of humility and service. And last week we kind of kicked off this whole discussion about being a servant. We talked about servants put others before themselves. Servants keep Jesus at the center of their thoughts and actions. And servants uh, serve without complaining. And we talked about all three of those things last week. But today I want to share with you a couple of other things about what it means to be a servant. Because listen, if you will be a servant, you will have a stronger marriage. You will have better relationships. You will enjoy life more. And you know what you'll begin to discover? Is that when you begin to serve people, people will begin to serve you. Your life will be so much better if you will begin to consider other people's deal to be more important than your own deal. So let's look at the life of Jesus here from John 13. Notice in verse 1 it says, It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world 
and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then verse 2 goes on, it says, The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Now here's what's so amazing with what, what's going on here in chapter 13. Jesus knows that Judas is about to sell him out. He knows that the disciples are about to abandon him. Listen, when Jesus was crucified, all the disciples went AWOL. He knew that Peter was about to deny him, and he loved them anyway. Is that not amazing? I mean, you would think that Jesus would be like, you guys are about to turn your backs on me. I'm not washing your feet. And, and instead, the response of Jesus is the exact opposite of that. And it reminds us today that God loves us regardless of where we have been and regardless of where we are. That's why we serve such an amazing an amazing God, because God loves us in spite of our past. He loves us in spite of even the things that we're going to do in the future. And he begins to exhibit that in this basin of water and in this towel. Here's what servants do. Servants, first of all, they take initiative. They take initiative. Jesus looked over, and he did the math, you know, and you have to think, well, why did Jesus pick feet washing, right? Well, I think this is what happened. He looked over and he saw they all had dirty feet. By the way, the disciples were not about to wash each other's feet. He saw the dirty feet and he saw the basin and he saw the water and he saw the towel and he put two and two together. Sometimes we make serving others rocket science, right? We, we make it too complicated. How should I serve somebody else? Just look for a need and take initiative. You don't even have to be asked. You know, I believe one of the, some of the greatest opportunities to serve others will be at times when you have not been asked, but where you just volunteered and said, you know what, can I help? Can I do something to help? Notice this in verse 4 and 5. He got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a, a towel around his waist, and after he had poured water into the ba basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I mean, this is simple stuff, but sometimes we're not willing to do the dirty work. We're not willing to get our 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 hands dirty doing the work of God. But if we would just look around and look for needs, I wonder what great opportunities that God would give to us. I remember about 10 years ago, my grandfather passed away, and my grandmother uh, was in her 80s and was, was very limited in her ability to move around. She had kind of a bum knee, and she walked with a cane, and, um, and she still does today. My grandmother's actually in her 90s today, man. She's, she's awesome. I love my grandmother. But she was not able to mow the grass. And, and my grandparents, they had a big yard. And they had a really fantastic Christian man that lived across the street. You know what he did? He came over and he mowed my grandmother's yard for several years until she was able to move and to move, in, and to move into another facility. My grandmother had very limited capacity to pay anybody. And she didn't really have any money. And obviously she couldn't get out there with the lawnmower. And, you know, I live 30 minutes away and I would come and do as much work as I could to try and help her. But, you know, I was so thankful that this man would be such a servant and, and help my grandmother out in such a time of need. Just being a servant, man. Just seeing a need. I don't think my grandmother even asked him. He just knew this lady's a widow. She's a senior adult. She may need a little help. And he did so for several years. Fantastic, isn't it? So appreciative. I remember when I was in high school, I was really struggling with math. And you know, they say that some people are really good at math and sciences, and then other, other people are really good at English and literature and stuff like that. I wasn't good at either one, you know. I was challenged in both areas. So I had to have a lot of help. But thank goodness, I had an old principal that lived down the street from me that was a, a neighbor family friend. And he tutored me and offered to tutor me in math um, for I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour a night, three or four nights a week. I was down there at his house. I am so grateful. He refused to even let my family pay him for, for helping me. But I'm going to tell you, my grades improved. My confidence got so much higher. I began to feel so much better about my schoolwork. Man, I needed some help. And he just volunteered. He just said, Ryan, let me help you. You know, that's what it means to be a servant, is where we just look for those opportunities. And I wonder how many opportunities are right before us in this very room, 
And some of us today may be saying, I don't know if that's me, or I don't know if I should say anything, or I don't know if I should do anything. But, but listen, servants take initiative. I remember several years ago, I was, uh, I was on a ski trip. I, I loaded up a bus. We had about 50 college kids that we had taken to Crested Butte for uh, a week of skiing. We had a great time. And on the way back, I was a, a, awake at 3.30 in the morning. I was w- woken up because the bus had caught on fire. 50 college kids on a bus. I wake up, one of our pastors is leaning out the door, hanging on to the rail of the bus, and the, the back tire is smoking. You know, the brake got locked down on the wheel, and it was making a big fire, smoke everywhere, all this kind of crazy stuff. Yeah, freaked everybody out. So we run off the bus, you know. I'm like, I'm getting off here first. You know, you guys get out of my way, you know. Everybody was stampeding out the door, you know. We're standing on the side of the road. It's 17 degrees in Dalhart, Texas, man, in the middle of the night. It's cold. And you know what, what, what happened? The Dalhart Volunteer Fire Department showed up. You know what the Volunteer Fire Department is? That's anybody that has a minivan that lives in Dalhart, Texas, man. <laughs> and these people showed up at mass. I mean, there were trucks and and cars and vans and just any type of vehicle. They were loading us up. These people just did, they didn't even know us. And there we were stranded. They picked us up in the middle of nowhere, took us and let us stay at their senior adult center. I'm telling you, that was an exciting place. <laughs> it was warm though, okay? It was warm. They brought us free donuts, you know? One of the churches there offered to cook us lunch. We had a great time. I think the people of Dalhart, Texas would have been thrilled to just have us stay there, you know. (laughs) I felt like we had made new best friends, you know, in many ways. I was so grateful. The people were just serving. They were so gracious. They were so helpful. Every time I drive through Dalhart, Texas, I think about that. And, And I think about what a blessing that that was. God wants us to get caught up in and serving others, and he wants us to take that initiative. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, there's a problem, let me help. I think I can do something. What do servants do? They also grow in humility. They grow in humility. It is a process that all of us have to go through to learn to serve others. Naturally, our natural bent is to always think about how does this affect me, and what do I think, and what does my schedule say, and you know, what is my opinion, but... But Jesus begins to esteem the disciples to be more important than himself. And when he comes to Simon Peter, he's not received with open arms. Look at verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am going to do, but later you will understand. In other words, Peter, you don't get it. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, well, unless I wash you, I will ha- you will have no part with me. And then, then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. In other words, just go ahead and give me a shower, Jesus. <laughs> now, why is, why is Peter resisting the help of Jesus? I believe it's because he was filled with pride. You know, sometimes when people offer to help us, we don't want help. Sometimes when we're struggling, we refuse to let people help us. And and that's really rooted in pride. Did you know that? Sometimes we just say, you know, my marriage is falling apart and I I'm struggling financially and I'm struggling struggling spiritually and I, and I don't know what to do about this and I don't know what to do about that, but I'm not going to ask anybody for help. I'm not going to let anybody help me because I got this all going on myself. And that was Peter. Jesus, you're not washing my feet. You're not going to help me. I'm going to do my own thing. If you flip it over, there's another side of pride too. Some people are prideful in refusing to let others serve them. Other people are prideful because they expect everybody to serve them. You know, some people come to church and they're like, what can everybody do for me? You know? And sometimes we can look around and think, well, you know, it's all about me and all about my issues and all about what's going on in my life. And, you know, that's driven by pride, too. God wants us to respond humbly. And the person of humility realizes that they need help from other people, but they also realize it's not all about them. So what do we do? 
servants grow in humility. And you see in, in verse 5, it says, After that he poured the water in the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So Jesus begins to, to wash all of the disciples' feet, but Peter told him no, but look at this. Then he said yes. And I love this about Peter. Now we, could, we, we make fun of Simon Peter sometimes when we read the Bible because he, he was kind of like the, the disciple that would always say things and then think about them later, right? And some of us are kind of like that before, you know, we, we say all this stuff, but then we think about it, and we're like, oh, I can't believe that came out of my mouth. Well, that was Simon Peter, right? Talk now and think later. And, and we see this when Jesus uh, and, and Peter are walking on the water in the Gospel of Matthew. As long as Peter's eyes were on Jesus, he's walking across the water. When he begins to look at the size of the wind and the waves, he begins to sink. He has this great moment of faith, and he has this total moment of doubt and unbelief. And I believe Simon Peter really is a, is, a, is a character that we can all relate to so well, because most people are filled with both. We are a complex combination of both faith and doubt, right? We have the ability to believe God for some big things, but then we also have the ability to get kind of freaked out too. And all that's going on, all that's swirling around in Simon Peter's mind. But listen, while Peter would say things he would have to apologize for later, let's give Peter some props because, listen, when Peter realized he had messed up, he corrected it, right? And that's the heart God wants us to, to, to have, is a heart of what the Bible calls repentance. Repentance is when we're going one direction and God shows us that we're wrong and then we change and we go back the other direction. And Peter, with no hesitation, moves from, you're not going to touch me, to give me a shower, please, Jesus, you know. <laughs> wash my hands, wash my head, wash all of me, you know. And I love the fact that he had this, this humble heart that just begins to, to, to turn and to twist. Maybe that's what God's saying to you today. Maybe you've been wrong about some things, but God's saying to you today, hey, it's time to flip over and to change. And to change immediately and to do so quickly. And then Peter received the blessing of it after that. You know, we need to be washed and bathed by Christ. That's why Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. In order that he, he could take care of our sin problem. In order that we could be reconciled to God. That we could be made right with God. We can't be in right standing with God if we don't understand why Jesus died and rose from the grave. Once we embrace that then God begins to change our hearts. He begins to change our minds. He begins to change our lives. And Jesus washed the feet of, pa of, of Simon Peter uh, to show him this. Now, this is so countercultural because in the ancient world, uh, the, the servant always esteemed the master. Moses was served by Joshua. Elisha served Elijah. The disciples served Jesus. And now Jesus takes this whole thing and he turns it around the opposite direction. And he says, the greatest among you will be the least. If you want to be first, you've you got to be last. And he begins to teach the disciples some, some profound things that they had never considered before. Jesus served without fanfare, without accolades. Uh, you know, Jesus' harshest words uh, in the Bible were not to the woman at the well, not to the woman caught in the act of adultery. Jesus' harshest words were to the Jewish religious leaders who were filled with pride and did not serve and did not have humility. And, and so we need to learn from that. I, I love verse 16 where it says, I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So servanthood is a mindset. It is a mentality. It influences everything that we think. When we begin to think like a servant, we begin to, to hold up the, the needs and the, the desires of other people. And we begin to consider those more important than what, what we want to do and what, what's going on in our lives. And, you know, I, I was so proud of our church yesterday. We had a, a, a fantastic day of serving. How many of you were over at the building yesterday with us serving? Yeah, a bunch of us, right? Yeah, we had over 100 people there on the campus yesterday. <laughs> doing stuff. Is that not cool? A hundred people, man, working hard. And we had guys there from 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. I'm talking like working hard, cleaning toilets and moving rocks and, 
And, and, and that's why half the church today is walking around like limping and stuff. If you see people, they look all sunburned and they look miserable to be at church today. It's not because they don't love the Lord. It's because they, they were busting rocks and moving rocks around all over the place for, for umpteen hours yesterday. But we, we served over 500 hours. We moved almost 100 tons of rock yesterday. Is that not amazing? We are the church that rocks, right? There you go. People were working hard. It was awesome, and I love that. And we just had a great time doing it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of proud today as a man. When you work hard, you need some battle wounds. And I don't know if you can see this in the back, but I, I was trying to cut a tree, and I got all these, these cuts on my wrist. You know, I almost fell out of the tree trying to cut the things. And I got a really great farmer's tan, you know. And you feel like if you got a farmer's tan and you got some battle wounds, you know, you're like you really did something for God. So as a man, I'm feeling good today. I'm feeling accomplished. And I hope, I hope you are too if you were out there. But you know what? When we serve God... We began to gain rewards. Look at John 13, 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus is saying, if you'll be a servant, if you'll wash people's feet, if you will serve people, if you will put other people's interests ahead of your own interests, you will be blessed. And there's not one person that's here today that, that does not want to be blessed by God. All of us want to be blessed. And when we serve God and we serve others, we will be blessed. Sometimes we see those blessings immediately. Sometimes those things are a little bit further down the road. Here's what I've found. Is, is I've, as I've served other people, I've found that people want to serve me. Isn't that amazing how that happens? I wonder how many marriages would be different if, if we began to wash the feet of our spouses. I wonder how many parent-child relationships would be different if, if in the home we were washing each other's feet so to speak and when you serve others you help change lives you know we have about 80 to 100 people that are actively serving here at the edge church but last week i got to tell you this 20 people signed up for the very first time to get involved in a ministry here at the church is that not awesome 20 people that's a lot of people it's a lot of people it's our biggest one day of signups that we've ever had before and you know, you're going to have an opportunity to sign up today as well, because I know God is moving in your life today. And by the way, the local church is the greatest place on the planet to serve God and to serve others. And so if you're not involved, man, this is your opportunity to sign up. We've got people with all their little shirts on and stuff, and they'll be at the back. And Pastor Jeff will tell us more about that at the end of the service. But, but I want you to pray about that. How, how would God want me to be involved? Now, you know, it's easy to look at it and say, you know, we're moving into this really sweet building here in a couple of weeks and and so because we're moving into a building we don't really have as many opportunities to serve as we do here because we're not going to have to unload that trailer and you know put up all this pipe and drape but you know what actually the very opposite is true because we now have our own facility we have way more responsibility than we have ever had before way more responsibility and so the way that we're going to handle that is we're going to get you involved in serving God and serving others in ways that you've never had an opportunity to do so before. It's going to be so exciting. You know what? We're going to have our very first security team. We're going to have people that are working on the grounds, doing what we did yesterday, trimming hedges and putting out rocks. We're going to have teams doing that. We're going to have people working in the kids' ministry. We're multiplying all of our kids' ministry classes. Our, our student ministry is growing. Uh, our worship service is growing. We need some people to clean some toilets for Jesus on Sundays, right? And I'm not joking. I am serious. We, we got all kinds of ways for you to be involved, and I believe God's going to use you in a great way to change lives, but I also believe God's going to bless you as a result of your faithfulness and oh my goodness it's going to be so so exciting to see what he's going to do you know when you serve others not only do you grow spiritually and you help change lives i believe you'll develop some of the greatest friendships that you'll ever have there's just there's something about serving with somebody being side by side arm in arm and you will develop some of the greatest friendships. And I, I'm amazed, at, and I've been doing the church thing for a long time. I've been a pastor for almost 20 years. 
And, and I'm, I'm amazed at, at, at so, sometimes, I don't hear that as much from our church, but in other churches I've served, I've heard this, and from time to time people say this to me, man, I don't know anybody at church. You know, I don't know anybody. If you don't know anybody, it's because you're not involved. And if you will begin to serve and get involved in a ministry, you will know tons of people. Your life is going to be enriched. Your life is going to be blessed. And you're going to make a difference in this community for the glory of God. Isn't that beautiful? I love the commentary on the life of King David in Acts 13, 36. It says, so after David had served in his generation, according to the will of God, he died and he was buried and his body decayed. I love that verse because I'm praying that we would be the church that would serve God in our generation and we would do what God has called us to do according to the will of God and that God would take our service and our devotion to him and that lives would be changed and that our community would be a different place from this point forward.